We are here with Marlene Zook. She is author of the book Paleo Fantasy, What Evolution Really Tells Us About Sex, Diet, and How We Live. She's an evolutionary biologist, and welcome. Thanks. Yes. So, the central thesis of this book is that there's no natural state of being for mankind, and that the ideas propounded by people, be it of diet, exercise, or child rearing, are fundamentally lacking in an understanding of science and evolutionary biology. So, tell us a little bit more about the book. You cover a lot of great topics And you have a lot of good sources for evidence for the points that you make. And my favorite point in the book, for all living beings, that it is not a proverbial staircase leading up to some sort of perfection. I believe that I've read this a number of times, so it's strange how a myth persists about evolution. You go to a great length to stress that evolution doesn't stop at a certain point, and you highlight a misconception of perfection. In reality, an organism can become well adapted to its environment, but not perfectly in tune with the world around it. What other sorts of misapprehensions are in the public understanding of life and evolution in general, and how do those misconceptions relate to what you talk about in the book? Well, I think it's an easy way to think about the reason that idea about the staircase leading to, you know, perfection is wrong is to think about all those cartoons that we're all probably familiar with about evolution, where you see a fish that kind of morphs into an amphibian that's crawling onto the land, and then you have a reptile, and then eventually you get to a mammal, and the mammal eventually is replaced by a, an ape or a monkey of some kind, and then finally, and it's always finally, with a person. And sometimes in the more modern versions, you get a person, kind of a, an early version of a human where there's a guy, and it is almost always a guy, standing upright and clutching a spear and looking kind of noble. And then the next and final shot is of a guy who's kind of pot-bellied and balding and, you know, slouched over a computer or maybe just sort of standing there, you know, clutching a cheeseburger or something like that. And the implication is that, oh, no, you know, we've, we've kind of fallen from grace somehow. And those images, I mean, they're funny, and, you know, there's lots of cute versions of them, but they contain within them this really deep misunderstanding about how evolution works, namely that evolution produces organisms kind of the way car manufacturers produce cars, where each model replaces the model before, and each model is better than the model before, or at least, you know, that's what the car manufacturers want us to believe. So, you know, the idea is that the 2013 version of, you know, the Honda or the Toyota or, you know, what have you, is better than the 2012 version, which in turn is, was better than the 2011 version, and so on and so forth. And so the idea is that eventually they're just replacing the old version. Right. Well, evolution doesn't work like that. It's not like mammals replaced reptiles. Sure, mammals evolved more recently than reptiles, but we've still got reptiles. And so all living things that are on the planet right now are just as evolved as all other living things. It's not like some of them are the old version and some of them are the new, modern, improved version. So that's one reason why those cartoons are inaccurate. And the other reason is that they imply that we're kind of trying to get somewhere and we're trying to get to what obviously is implied, people. And, of course, evolution doesn't have any purpose or goal or way of getting to anything stuff just happens and organisms are adapted in some environments and they can get better adapted in those environments and certainly that echoes part of what those cartoons are conveying but it's not like people are kind of the pinnacle of evolution we're not any more evolved or more highly evolved which is kind of a weird term that you hear a lot right uh, than any other living thing Right. You know, one of the other misconceptions that I think it it kind of feeds into this idea that evolution is a straight line when it's really more of a radial thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. Yeah. And so, again, you know, those they always show these progressions. So one thing leads to another thing. And in fact, the way evolutionary biologists think about this is more like a tree with lots and lots of branches and the trunk of the tree is back in time. And then the tips of the branches, all of which grow upward in this representation, are the species that are around now, and there's some branches that stopped a while ago and they went extinct, but it's not like a Christmas tree where there's a little star at the top and the star is a person. Right. It really reminds me of the same fallacy that creationists make where they say that... I was just thinking that. um, You know, well, if I'm evolved from chimps, which isn't even true, why are there still, you know, like, well, of course there's still chimps. Of course there's still chimps. We have a common ancestor. It is sort of weird how that one keeps coming up, and, you know, because the answer is really obvious. If you came from your parents, so why are your parents still here? Right, right. Well, the 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 whole idea... It really is almost exactly like that, that, you know, you have a common ancestor with all other living things, including chimps and Mm -hmm. whatever else you want to talk about, and our ancestor with chimps is more recent than our ancestor with, you know, petunias or sea anemones, but (laughs) 
that right. doesn't really signify. It's even right. it's even more absurd because they're not our parents; they're like our cousins. And of course, yeah. you could be this alive at the same time as your cousins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. So I think it stems from this old, old, old idea from the early biologists, where there was this kind of linear progression. What is it called? It's called a scalenature. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, Aristotle talked about it. It's actually it's a very old idea. It was related to religion that the the angels were sort of imperfect copies of God, and then you got sort of more and more imperfect. So humans were less perfect copies of God than the angels, and other animals were even less perfect copies. And somehow you had this transformation where you started with something, depending on how much you knew about living things, you could maybe start with a worm, or if you knew more about living things, maybe you'd start with a one-celled thing like an amoeba. And then, you know, again, you got this progression where everything's kind of moving toward greater perfection. And so once you put it like that and you say, well, if you have this idea that, oh, everything's evolving toward a certain point, then you realize, well, it, it came from a very teleological idea. It came from this idea that we're all attaining some kind of super perfect being. And that's not science. That's just somebody's belief system. It's teleology, really. Yeah. yeah it's just kind of nonsense. But it, it's, it's interesting that these ideas kind of persist. Yeah, there's something that's clearly very appealing to people about this business of being highly evolved or, you know, being evolved so that you get somewhere or that you're progressing to something. Some psychologists should do a study of this because I have no idea why it is that it's been so persistent. And, you know, my students are very invested in this. They always talk about this and such being more highly evolved. And biologists now really don't talk about things being higher and lower organisms because that suggests that, again, the lower ones are kind of less perfectly formed somehow, and that's just not the case. It's an anthropocentrism, really, yeah. <laughs> is what it is. So that's a good discussion to have. And you bring up a phenomenon called rapid evolution, which is also interesting. So let's talk a bit more about that. And you take the poster child example of the ability to digest lactose. In a talk you gave about paleofantasy, which is on Vimeo, I believe you can watch it. Mm -hmm. We'll link to that. You mentioned about how this is representative of how culture can have an effect on rapid evolution. I was wondering if you could expand on this a little bit. Actually, rapid evolution is why I got interested in writing the book in the first place. I do a lot of my own research on insects and the system I was working on, which has to do with crickets in Hawaii, and which I do discuss in the book, turned out to exhibit an occasion of extremely rapid evolution, where we had a big change in what the crickets did, um, namely whether or not they were able to call, in less than 20 generations. And I was really excited about that, and it was a really interesting discovery. And it made me then think about all the ways that scientists now talk about evolution happening not just over millions of years or even tens of thousands of years, but very quickly over relatively few generations. And then that made me think about the ways in which evolution has happened quickly to humans. It turns out that evolution has happened very quickly to humans, and what that does is change our ideas about whether or not we were better adapted to the way we were living 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 years ago, because it turns out that we can, in fact, change relatively rapidly. And so lactose tolerance is one of the best examples of this, and that's why I you know, talk about it as being a poster child for rapid evolution, in part because we know so much about how that's happened. So I'm sure everybody knows that humans, like other mammals, drink milk when we're infants, and that's kind of what makes us mammals. Mm -hmm. Most mammals, and indeed lots and lots of humans, lose the ability to digest milk and to digest the sugar lactose that's in milk around the time we're weaned. And so adult mammals of most species can't digest dairy products. Well, in some humans, it turns out that we can the way we think it happened is this. Imagine that people, say about seven or so thousand years ago, in various parts of the world, were herding animals. And we know that they were doing this for meat and for the animals' hides. And so they weren't using milk from animals like that. They were just using it, the animals for their meat and for their hides. But let's say that in those populations, there were some humans who just because there's a lot of genetic variation in all populations for many traits happen to be able to break down lactose past the time of weaning. They had what's called lactase persistence 
which means that they still retain the enzyme that you need to break down milk sugar. Well, those people would have been at a real advantage compared to the other people in the population because they not only had a food source that other people in the population didn't have, some scientists have suggested they also had a source of uncontaminated fluid. So they were able to have something to drink that, that didn't have dirt or pathogens or you know, some other contaminant in it. So they were then at an advantage, so they survived and reproduced more than the people that couldn't digest lactose. That then meant that there was more motivation, as it were, to start to continue hurting animals. And so that then meant that being able to digest dairy was more advantageous. And you get a process that's called gene culture coevolution. So the cultural practice of herding cattle or other animals then selects for the genes that allow you to digest dairy. Those genes then make it more likely that you're going to engage in the cultural practice and you get kind of the snowballing effect. And what that has led to is a genetic change in populations you know, alive today, whose ancestors came from animal herding people. And there's several of those populations. Some of them are in Northern Europe. Some of them are in Africa. There's some elsewhere. And the idea is that we can demonstrate a genetic change in those people, which means there's been evolution just in the last five to 7,000 years, which is incredibly fast from an evolutionary standpoint. Right. And so we aren't like our ancestors. So if you say, oh, well, we shouldn't be consuming dairy because our ancestors 10 or 15,000 years ago and before that weren't consuming dairy. Well, you're right about part of that. Certainly they weren't consuming dairy 10 or 15,000 years ago, but that's because their genes were different, and the genes now have allowed us to actually make use of a different food source. So humans have evolved just in five to 7,000 years, and this is a really nice example because we understand a lot more about the actual genes involved, but there's still lots of other examples uh, about, of, of rapid human evolution. Right. And, and in the book, you go into it about the wet versus dry earwax in Asian populations and Native Americans. They have dry earwax as opposed to Europeans and Africans and others who have wet earwax, which is kind of an odd one. But it is well, an yeah, evidence. I, I, that was part of why I wanted to include it is that, you know, it's not like every trait that we can demonstrate that's changed in people is a do or die sort of thing. It's, it's not immediately clear why you would have had rapid evolution in earwax, but yeah. there you go. It is kind of a weird one, but uh, there's there's other examples too, like the people in the Andes who are better able to get oxygen at a thinner elevation. Yeah, and, and, so, and so increasingly, I mean, what's, what started to happen just over the last decade or so is that our ability to detect what are called the signatures of selection, the the changes in our genome that occur because of recent, if, you know, recent evolution, that ability has just increased tremendously because the technology to actually read small changes in the genome has been changing just enormously in the last decade. And so the technological advances in genomics have made it really an amazing time, in my opinion, to be an evolutionary biologist because you know, it's like you're studying evolution in real time. You're actually able to see changes in the genome at a scale that's just unprecedented. We were never able to do this before, and so it's, it's a really exciting time for evolutionary biology, I think. Yeah, it's a really exciting time for biology on the whole, I think. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of good things going on right now. One of the things that kind of relates to this is in the final chapter of your book, you have a subchapter called Are We Violating the Law of the Jungle? And what you examine in that subchapter is the idea that technology of the modern age has stalled us evolutionarily. Now, we know from examining rapid evolution that this is not the case. You mentioned that, that you're not in the camp of evolutionary biologists that buys into that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So it's really easy to look around at the world and to say, okay, modern technology has let us sort of escape the constraints of natural selection. And, and in a sense, that's true. For example, there are a lot of people alive today who would never have survived before modern medical care, who would never have survived because they would have either starved to death or there would have been some other problem that would have led to them not having reproduced and passed on their genes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have contraception, we have modern medical care, we have public health awareness that allows us to avoid getting sick from a lot of things that would have killed people not all that long ago. So given that, it's tempting to then conclude, well, okay, evolution's just stopped for us. We're, we're no longer evolving because we've kind of escaped the things that selection would ordinarily use. 
namely, you know, killing us off by sickness or by, you know, or simply by changing the number of children we're going to have. You know, we do that culturally now, not just dictated by our biology. But the problem is that we are still evolving because the real way to look at the question is to think not about things that do or don't kill us, but to think about how we're leaving genes in future generations. And a primatologist at the University of Calgary, Mary Pavelka, put this, I think, really well in an article about human evolution, where she said the real question you want to ask is not are we still evolving, but does everybody have the same number of children? Mm -hmm. And, of course, they don't. There's still differential reproduction, both within small populations and, of course, globally across the world. People are having wildly different numbers of children. Well, what that means is that there's going to be differential representation of genes in future generations, which is a lot of what evolution is about. So if we're not all having the same number of children, then we could actually look at who's more likely to be successful in terms of their genes being left in future generations. Right, the level of fitness. what's that going to do to the gene pool as a whole? You can really look at this, again, in real time, and people have done exactly that. There are a number of long-term studies of humans that are trying to figure out how the human genome is going to change just in a relatively small number of generations. One of my favorites was done in Massachusetts in Framingham, where there was already a long-term study of people's health in that town as a way to try and understand cardiac health and things that did and didn't influence people's blood pressure and cholesterol levels and how that was related to their likelihood of getting heart disease and so forth. Even um, their, so even their the morphology. The study was originally undertaken not for evolutionary purposes, but it turns out to be actually a very good study from an evolutionary perspective because it was detailed information on how many kids people were having and a whole bunch of their, their health characteristics, like their cholesterol, their blood pressure, their height, their weight, and so forth. And it turns out that if you look at the people of Framingham, Massachusetts, or at least the study initially was focused just on women, and then saying, all right, well, if these patterns persist that we're seeing of people's blood pressure and cholesterol and so forth, if they persist for another 10 generations, what are people going to look like? You can figure it out. It's there in the reproductive patterns of the people that are around today. And it turns out, if you're curious, that in 10 generations, which uh, I guess none of us are going to be around to see, <laughs> uh, but in 10 generations, the women of Framingham are going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, they're going to be about a kilo fatter, so which is 2.2 uh, uh, pounds. They're going to have slightly lower blood pressure and slightly lower cholesterol levels. So... They right. will have evolved. Their right. genes will have changed. Right. It, it, it's re remarkable how quickly evolution can affect one's body morphology and things like that. Uh, a while ago, I read something in, uh, I think it was Nat Geo, some science blog, that was saying that we are going to have the same skin color, eye color, everything like that, will be approximately what European ancestry Brazilians look like. And I kind of think it's interesting to think that, but I don't really know how true that is, given the geography that humans mm -hmm. are spread over. I don't really think that that's the case. We can travel a lot more easily today, but there's still a lot of places where yeah, yeah there's a lot of diversity. Yeah. So I don't really know how true that, that really is. Well, and of course, a lot depends on what evolutionary biologists will call gene flow, which is just a fancy way of talking about people moving around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to what extent, you know, certainly it's true that we do have a lot more gene flow, so people from Brazil can end up marrying and having kids with people from, you know, Africa, which was not something that was possible even a very short time ago. But at the same time, having all that gene flow also introduces more genetic variation into populations, which means that there's more potential combinations. So the idea that we're going to get sort of homogeneous, maybe for some things, but I'm pretty sure not for everything. Well, we're, we're pretty homogenous right now. What are we? I think we're 99.9% uh, .9 all similar. You know, there's there's not really too much differentiation from client to client. I, I don't really know that that's... That that'll happen. Yeah, that that'll happen. <laughs> that that's too realistic. Well, I like to talk about the concept of authenticity seeking. And you kind of mention it in your book where you say, if people are longing to go back to the Pleistocene, 
why not long to be aquatic? If they... Well, yeah, you know, and I mean, to some extent, obviously, that was, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek, but yeah. the idea is that if you romanticize what it was like at a certain point in our history, you conveniently forget that, well, at that point in history, we'd also come from someplace. It's not like we got into the Pleistocene and then everybody said, oh, good, you know, this is where we're just, you know, going to be perfectly suited and life is great and, you know, everything is wonderful because, of course, when humans evolved, one example is, you know, think about when humans evolved to be bipedal. You could make lots of arguments that being bipedal is really not a fabulous thing for humans. Walking on two legs gives you skeletal problems. It's one of the things that contributes to a lot of back pain in people. Um, you know, that just the way the legs and hips and pelvic girdle are arranged is, uh, you know, not ideal from some mechanical perspectives. And it makes childbirth more difficult because the pelvic girdle can only, you know, get so big and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's kind of silly to think, oh, well, you know, people just went wrong when we became bipedal because it's not like there was some path. You know, this goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's not like there was some path that we were on and we were marching steadily toward in this particular direction. I guess we were marching on four legs rather than on two. <laughs> but in any event, it's not like we were, we were going in this particular direction and then, oops, we got off the path and started doing all this weird stuff like becoming bipedal or developing agriculture. Now, that's different than saying that there can't be a mismatch between our physiology and the way our bodies work and the modern world, because that's also clearly true. I mean, obviously, we didn't evolve under circumstances where we had tons of highly refined and nutrient-poor food that we were eating. Being around those foods contributes to health problems. Yeah. But that's different. That's, yeah. That's not the same thing as saying that, oh, we would be perfect if we just lived like we did back in some mythical path. Well, like I said, it is an authenticity-seeking yeah. mindset. It, it really pulls from the whole idea of Rousseau's noble savage. You know, well, it, or even going further back than that, I mean, lots of people for lots of periods have talked about some kind of golden age. I mm -hmm. once had, in an interview, had someone point out that really, in some ways, it goes back to the idea of the Garden of Eden, that, mm -hmm. you know, we were perfect, right. and then somehow we fell from grace. And I think you see echoes of that culturally in all kinds of places. But yeah, certainly the noble savage is, is a, a really good and, and somewhat more modern example. I like to use the word romantic, because it's, yeah. it's, it, it is a fantasy. It's a romantic kind of fantasy. People pick different time periods in our history, yeah, whether like the they're 50s. long ago or recent. Yeah. Like the conservatives of the United States like to say that the, the 50s, 50s were the were great the best, yeah. era, you know. Right, you know, when we had this family structure that for some reason seemed like they liked it better, but in actual fact, well, that was a family structure that existed at some points, and then there's other family right. structures, and, you know, you can certainly say, well, you know, did some of them work better than others, and try to emulate the ones that you do think worked better. But, again, that's different than suggesting that, we evolve to do this particular thing, and if we don't do this particular thing, it will be bad for us. I always do like to point out, it's not like I disagree with the idea that you know, it does seem pretty obvious that humans didn't evolve to sit in cubicles and you know, crash on over computers and you know, eat junk food all day. I mean, this is clearly something that's not good for our bodies, and it's not good for our bodies because we did not evolve in that manner. But that's really different than suggesting that humans haven't evolved or that we need to hew to some imaginary past. Right. And also, if even if something was the fittest thing for humans or any species to be doing at a certain time, it doesn't mean that it's going to be true for the entirety of that species' evolution. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it's yeah, not like... Yeah, and, and I think that this, too, points to a pretty basic thing about evolutionary biology, which is that all organisms all the time are this endless series of compromises and trade-offs and things that work okay under some circumstances and not okay under others. Well, thinking about the Tibetans who are successful at higher altitudes, well, they do have an adaptation that allows them to live at high elevations, but if they go to lower elevations, that adaptation is no longer relevant, and there may in fact be bad things about it. It's just that at high elevations, people with those genetic characteristics survived and reproduced better than people without them. You know, or, or sickle cell anemia, which is an example that lots of people are familiar with, where if you have one copy of the sickle cell gene, then you are able to resist malaria, which is obviously a good thing. Mm -hmm. But if you have two copies of it, then you have sickle cell disease, and if you don't receive medical treatment, you're likely to die at an early age. So is the sickle cell trait a good thing for people? Well, sure. If they live in an area with malaria, then they're more likely to survive and reproduce. If they live in an area without malaria, then 
it's just kind of a lose-lose because you're never going to get anything out of having it. And if you do inherit two copies of the gene, then you're going to have a lot of problems. So does that mean that when the gene evolved that it was progress? Of course not. It was just what happened. What an evolutionary trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's so, not so really an evolution is full of those because you're always using the parts that you had before. It's not like you get to start anew and say, oh, okay, now we're going to evolve into something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not Pokemon, basically. <laughs> so, uh, I, had to, I had to bring it up. It's not just true for humans, either. It's also true in other animals, too. A polar bear is not going to be able to live in a tropical zone. You know, so it's, it's... Well, right, yeah. And so, you know, all the things about a polar bear make it great for living in cold places with lots of meat. But mm -hmm. right. not so much if you are not in a cold place with lots of meat. Right. Uh, and this is certainly true at even a smaller scale. And one of the fascinating things about looking at living things is that you see how, in great detail, there's all kinds of these trade-offs and these compromises and things that are kind of modified from other parts and so forth. And I don't know if you've ever looked at Neil Shubin's book, Your Inner Fish. Yes, that's a great um, book. Which talks a little bit about exactly that, that you know, we all carry in us parts that are from our evolutionary ancestors that were fish. And fish, of course, and our ancestors lived in water. And if you don't live in water, then you have to modify the parts that allow you to live in water to enable you to live on land, and that works okay, but there's places where it's a real problem, and there's lots of things about, say, the human body where you look at those and you think, wow, that was really not a very good idea. <laughs> and the reason is that you weren't starting from scratch. You weren't starting from a place where you said, I'm going to build a perfect bipedal organism that's going to be able to live on land and do all the things that people do. And this gets back to something else I talk about in the book, which is that there's a very famous saying from a Nobel Prize winning scientist, Francois Jacob, who died actually just earlier this year and who was a very well-known geneticist. But he also was interested in evolution, and he said... Well, you have to understand that evolution is a tinkerer and not an engineer. Mm -hmm. What he meant by that is that you see, I mean, the word tinkerer is kind of old-fashioned, but, you know, basically just means somebody who builds stuff from all the parts and bits and pieces lying around in the garage, as opposed to an engineer who is someone who designs things that are purpose-built, that are manufactured specifically to suit a particular purpose. The engineer wants to build a bridge, and there's going to be a bridge made out of components that are from the factory where you said, okay, I need a bolt that's going to do exactly this. I'm, I need you know, a span that's going to have exactly this curvature and so forth. And you get a bridge that hopefully works, but all of the parts in it were built for that bridge. But a tinkerer, if they were going to try and get across a river and build something that would function as a bridge, and they had to use what was in the garage, would end up with something that had soup cans and tennis balls and bits of wire and garden hose in it, and it might get across the river just fine, and you could get from you know the east bank to the west bank, but you would look at it and you would think, wow, this is kind of nuts, because having a tennis ball here is not nearly as good as if you could have had an actual part that you know was made out of metal and that functioned. But it's not as elegant. people <laughs> and other living things are, are like that bridge in that we have to be built, as it were, from the parts that were lying around the garage, namely the, the genes and the bits that were our ancestors. Evolution basically builds things as a kludge. Yeah. It's a kludge, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good way of putting it. I don't really understand why people think that there's this perfection that we're all getting to from evolution, or, or that evolution is, is a completely 100% process where it knows exactly every step that it's taking. Or that it knows anything. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> it it's not knowledge. taking... Yeah, it has knowledge. That it, that's a teleology kind mm -hmm. of behind it, you know. That's why people say that, oh, well, it's irreducibly complex. You know, it has to be guided by some kind of force. Mm. It's not really. Uh, moving along you know, from that. Uh, you know, in some ways, at the same time, it is true that when you look closely at living things, it is amazing how they seem to function. And, you know, I do work on insects, and so if you dissect something really tiny and you dissect a cricket, which I've done lots, mm -hmm. you, you know, you look inside and you think, geez, this is truly extraordinary how all the parts work. There's these little tiny tubes and they bring air to and from the rest of the body and the digestive system and, you know, all the reproductive parts and so on. I mean, it really does seem extraordinary how well it works. So I'm not trying to suggest that, you know, everything's kind of a mess because obviously, you know, our physiology functions. Mm -hmm. But yeah. at some other level, yeah, you're right that, that it isn't 
all sort of completely perfectly and certainly not purposefully designed. Right, and and Neil Shubin does get into that. He <laughs> One of the things that sticks out from that book is that he says that, well, we can blame our shark ancestors for cancer. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I, I blame the sharks for cancer now as well as shark deaths. <laughs> which actually does put paid another uh, myth that people have, which is that there are all these horrible things that have happened in modern life like that oh well you know people living in this earlier era the you know noble savage or whatever they had these wonderful peaceful lives they were very healthy and of course things like cancer are because we live this modern technological existence and in fact it turns out that's not true right yeah so in this paleo fantasy book you talk a lot about diet and health and there's this idea that perpetuates that there's a, a perfect human diet that consists only of natural things like wild game, fruits and vegetables, processed foods such as cereals and dairy are completely out. They're not favored by our systems and they're not nutritionally useful to us. So what are some of the pretty major problems that are evident upon scrutiny of this idea? One of the things that becomes clear if you look at what you think ancient people were actually eating or for that matter if you look at what contemporary hunter-gatherer people or foraging people are eating is that it seems like human beings have been able to thrive on a wide variety of foods. Like I was saying before, it, you, no one's going to argue with you if you point out that we did not evolve to live on Cheetos and Diet Coke and sit around on the couch all day. I mean, that's a pretty uncontroversial statement. Right. But if you start trying to get much more specific than that, it actually creates a lot of problems. For example, did we eat a lot of meat in our history or a little bit? Well, it depends where you look. And the data are not always all that great, but there were some people like the Inuits or someone who lived in you know, what's now northern Canada or Alaska, and they relied a lot more on animal products than people in other parts of the world who were able to use a lot more plant products and potentially even do some rudimentary forms of farming or you know, gathering grain. There was a big thing a few years ago. There were you know, tons of headlines about how oh, they discovered that early human ancestors had actually pounded the seeds from a plant that's related to cattails and made a flower out of that, mix it with water, and, and produce what all the news outlets referred to as a primitive form of pita bread. Because I was clear that everybody was grasping for, like, what is this like? Because we can't just call it a flat bread because people weren't really relating to that. So they all called it pita bread. Right. So clearly they, they all decided that was going to be a great descriptor. But in any event, and the reason this was such a huge deal was that it spoke to exactly what you were talking about, that, oh, well, but if our ancestors were actually eating starches and grains and carbs, then, you know, what does that say about what we should be eating now? And, you know, the answer is that it tells us what we kind of already knew, which is, I mean, it, is, it was certainly an interesting discovery. I'm not trying to suggest that it wasn't. And there was also stuff about, you know, when people started cooking. And so it's not that it wasn't an interesting discovery, but we already knew that people ate lots of different things, and they ate lots of different things in different parts of the world. So trying to come up with this single, this is the diet that we should all be eating, and we should all adhere to it in lots of small details is, a pretty hard thing to do. You can kind of liken it to the way people eat now. Cuisine differentiates pretty widely over geographical spread. There's similarities, don't get or, me wrong. Or here in San Francisco. Or here in San Francisco. <laughs> uh, but there are similarities, don't get me wrong. I mean, in the Mediterranean, there's lots of similar dishes all over the place. People in the very outlands of Russia don't eat exactly the same as the people in the Iberian Peninsula. Then that's just dictated by what they have around them. If you, you watch know. a travel and food show, it yeah. Really it drives that home. Well, yeah, I mean, she mentioned the Inuit, and they yeah. do eat a lot more animal products because there's nowhere to farm yeah. around there. It's very hard to, to farm wheat in snow, <laughs> you know, or ice. So that's a really good point. The, the other thing, of course, about trying to emulate what people were eating 10 or 20,000 years ago is that even if you wanted to, it would be very difficult because pretty much all of our foods are very much modified Right. from their ancestral form. I mean, you could go exclusively with wild game, and that would probably be fairly similar to what humans would have been eating a long time ago. But mm -hmm. virtually all of the plant foods that we now eat, with, you know, with some exceptions, but virtually all of them have been so modified by domestication that they're almost unrecognizable compared to what their original form was. Certainly corn, apples, tomatoes, potatoes, all of them came from very small, what look like, you know, really unappetizing versions of what we would now consider edible or desirable or, you know, something we'd want to eat. Right. And, and you know, again, this is not to say that what we're eating now is better or worse. It's just a lot different. 
than what what we started with. Right. Rice was originally kind of a grass seed kind of thing. Now it's the big yeah. um, plump grains that we have today. Very different. So that kind of feeds into my next question. It's something that I hear often repeated to a mantric degree in a lot of these circles that express an interest in, in Paleolithic kind of life and pre-agricultural life. And it was even expressed by Jared Diamond in a 1987 piece he wrote called The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race. It was in Discover Magazine, actually, and that's pretty impressive. But he basically puts forth that agriculture was the worst mistake that we've ever made, which (laughs) I don't really see that there's any evidential truth to that. But on an evolutionary and geopolitical level, there are lots of people that say that this is correct. Now, could we have gotten to where we are today as a civilization, as a society of, of human beings all over the world without the advent of agriculture? Well, no, absolutely not. But see, that's a different point. And I think what Jared Diamond's trying to say is, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to discuss. I mean, it's sort of like what I was saying before, that, you know, maybe bipedal was really bad for us. Mm-hmm. And you could make that argument that, you know, this stuff isn't good for us and it did terrible things. Agriculture clearly has costs and benefits. You know, I'm not going to say there was the worst mistake in the history of the human race. Right. But again, the idea that you could make mistakes suggests that there's a right and a wrong way to go, and evolution doesn't work like that. And so I think what Jared Diamond was talking about was really, you know, what have we wrought? But I don't think he was trying to suggest that there is this pathway along which we're trying to walk, and we should walk in this particular way, and we will do better. You know, agriculture happened, and there are lots of you know, bad things about it. Uh, when human beings settled down and became sedentary rather than moving around following their food sources, mm-hmm. two things. One is that it meant that the population could become larger because you can support a bigger population with agriculture than you can as a hunter-gatherer. And that, in turn, means that there are diseases that are able to be established and can be sustained in a population that's of a reasonable size. So measles, for instance, requires a certain population size before it can become epidemic. And you wouldn't have measles if you were living a hunter-gatherer existence. But, again, evolution didn't really have a purpose. And it's just not like we were going a certain way and then, oops, we made a mistake. Any more than we made a mistake by getting out of the water and going onto land or by becoming bipedal, even though you could argue that there are downsides to all of those things. Right. One of the things that I think that a lot of people point out from the advent of agriculture is that this is where the disparity between the rich and the poor really began. Absolutely, yeah. So you get a stratified society um, when you have agriculture because you end up being able to store food. Then that means some people are going to be able to store it and some people aren't. Some people are going to be able to use it you know, as currency. Some people aren't. Yeah, I mean, it was a really interesting article because you know, he talks about this huge cascade of events that happens once you settle down and farm your food. There's effects on virtually every part of your life. So disease, like I just mentioned, was one of them. You also end up potentially with resource management issues because if you're always getting water from the same place, then that water may be in short supply some of the time, or it may become contaminated, and again, that creates issues with disease and so forth. So yeah, there's enormous effects of settling down, but nobody, at least of all, you know, Jared Diamond is arguing that you know, humanity should go back to a hunter-gatherer existence. I mean, no, that ship has sailed. And I was going to say, the, way, the horses are out of the barn. You know, something that... We didn't have ships. In, well, no, I guess you can have ships. If, you can have small boats if you're um, even even in a pre-agricultural yeah. society, right? Right. Yeah. You know, kind of canoes. Ships, uh, you know, sail, sailing ships. I guess came later. <laughs> yeah, that was that was that was a bit later, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't. Anyway, so so I think there, there's there's sort of two points in there that I that sometimes get conflated, you know, and one of them is the point of whether agriculture is bad for you or not, which is certainly something you could talk about, but. The other is, you know, oh, but human beings were on this great path, and then somehow agriculture happened, and we just fell from grace, like we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. And I don't really think that Jared Diamond is suggesting that we go back to, you know, hunter-gatherer societies. He's not part of the paleo. And I think it is very instructive to think about the ways in which our society has changed and to think about, are there some things that hunter-gatherer type societies do better that we might learn from? And I, you know, I think that's a completely valid question to ask. Yeah. You know, it, what he's basically doing is giving pause for reflection upon all that we have wrought, <laughs> as he said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, though, there are a lot of people out there that uh, really suggest that this is the case and we would be better off, you know, at a almost, what, 7.5 billion population population. 
you know, we would be better off if we just completely shucked the entire, you know, uh, <laughs> capitalist society yeah. that we live in now. I would and also say the horses have left the barn and the, the boats have sailed on oh, that yeah, one. Yeah, the boats but... have sailed. The horses left on the boats, That's actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Why, why is it that all those analogies end up being related to things that have happened post agriculture? Don't we That's have any right. good metaphors? For right. <laughs> yeah. Parties? You know. Well, the hunting the hunting party has left. The, is, ape, yeah, the okay. apes have started to stand. <laughs> we've we've <laughs> we've come out of the trees and started to stand upright. I would say the arrow has left the bow, but bow hunting was actually a big advance over spear hunting. So yeah. That's probably yeah. not a good one either. The bow has replaced the idle addle. So. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, I recently read a book, and that's what got me really interested in this. Uh, I recently read a book by an anarcho-primitivist named Alia Keith. She wrote a book called The Vegetarian Myth. In this book, she talks about how diseases were brought on by farming grains that we never had before, like celiac disease is one of them that you can really think of off the top of your head. And these are caused by uh, the plants using their natural defenses against us. So <laughs> is there any truth to this, that grains are trying to kill us? <laughs> Okay, so grains can't try to do anything. They have no cognitive ability. So I'm going to break, break, it, break it to you. You can talk to your plants, and plants communicate and all of that, but uh, your plants will not talk back to you, right. um, and your plants have no cognitive ability. Having right. said that, so they're not trying to do anything. But having said that, sure, in the world, plants that are eaten by herbivores, you know, like never mind people, but, you know, if you imagine your shrub that's going to be eaten by a deer or something. So plants have what are called natural defenses. And these are chemicals that are produced by the plant that are either toxic or somehow otherwise deter animals from eating them. Sometimes they're called secondary compounds. Lots of plants have lots of different versions of this. It's why some plants are completely inedible, um, you know, hemlock or you know, something like that, that we would consider poisonous. Some of them also have physical defenses. I mean, having thorns, for example, is something that will deter a predator from eating them because if you try and eat them and your mouth gets torn up, then you'll stop eating that plant. And so the plants with thorns survived and reproduced. So, you know, mm -hmm. sure, they, they evolved all kinds of defenses, both chemical and physical. What we've done with the plants that we use as food is applied evolution ourselves through artificial selection and domestication to precisely cut down on exactly those compounds that make it difficult for herbivores, animals like us that eat plants, to consume and digest those foods. We still can't, for example, digest cellulose because the cell walls are just physically impossible for us to break down. Right. So we as animals can't digest grass. We can eat animals that do digest grass, like cows, because they have adaptations that have evolved over a long time to allow them to do that. One of the things that we do, we do this unconsciously. So when you take the corn plant that has the biggest ear with the plumpest kernels, and the ones that taste the sweetest, and you breed them so that they're going to make more of that particular corn and ones that seem to taste more bitter, that's exactly what you've done, is you've created a form of the plant that has fewer of these secondary compounds. Whether we've overcome them completely or not, I mean, I don't think we can, we're ever going to be able to do that, but domestication is exactly directed at overcoming plant defenses against being eaten. Right. One of the big ones that she talks about in, in her book is, I don't really know how to describe it. A lot of people talk about soy being completely poisonous and causing cancers and things like that. Now, I don't know how true that is, and I've actually never looked up any real information on it. But you do hear a lot about this. You and do. I think some of it has to do with what's called phytoestrogens, which are plant versions of the hormones that we have in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And there is certainly a potential for some of these to interact with our bodies in ways that are not desirable. Usually, you A, have to have a highly modified form of the plant product in order for that to be a problem, and you have to eat an awful, awful lot of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of this stuff is kind of out there in terms of the science, and people are still sort of arguing back and forth so that there are human populations that have eaten a lot of soy and seem to not have ill effects, like the Japanese. You know, I vaguely heard what you're talking about. I mean, I'm not a nutritionist, so it's yeah. not something that's an area of expertise. And you, you mentioned that, you know, the, the Japanese population eats a lot of soy. Is it possible that they could have developed a defense to these sorts of things in rapid evolution? Something um, that you could possible. think of. It's possible. I don't know if anybody's ever looked at it. Yeah. Uh, lactase persistence or lactose tolerance is certainly a good example of how there's geographic variation in people's ability to digest certain foods. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of different than talking about the toxins that are involved. 
you know, a lot of this is stuff that's really complicated and it's hard to figure out the details. Right, right. And do the proper testing to really well, yeah, suss it and, out. Well, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I, I really do think it's it's just really difficult to say, okay, here, this is the perfect diet for people or, you know, this diet is absolutely awful or you know, something right. like that. Yeah, another point of this is the level of activity that people have nowadays is fairly slim <laughs> compared to back in the days when we farmed heavily and, and things yeah. like that. So there's lots of people that are saying that, okay, well, our physical activity levels now are, are very low, and that's a bad thing. Roundly, that is known as a bad thing. I'm guilty of that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly the most physically active person in the world either. Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody you know, is probably achieving the degree of physical activity that you would achieve if you were a hunter-gatherer or right. something. But, and I think, you know, as with the diet, there's a point at which this is unarguable that our bodies are not well designed for, as it were, for just sitting around all the time. Um, sitting seems particularly bad for us, so it's not necessarily so much the real heart-pounding exercise. It's that sitting seems to be something that's just not very good, and there's been some really interesting research looking at people who are exercising really vigorously for just an hour a day and then spending the rest of it completely motionless, that, that apparently is pretty bad for you, even if the amount of exercise you're getting is in keeping with some of the guidelines that have been recommended. Right, right. See, see this is a far cry, so saying that, you know, yeah, that's right, you know, people used to be a lot more active. And you're right, when we were farming, so here agriculture isn't the real demon, it's industrialization. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, people used to be a lot more active. From that to say that, okay, we should actually have activity levels and forms of activity that are like what people had when they were hunter-gatherers seems a little more far-fetched. Yeah. Right. In your book, you, you mentioned the angry sprinting and lugging around big rocks to simulate lugging around large prey and things like that. I don't really know that those types of exertions are any more or less beneficial than riding your bike, you know, eight miles. Right, yeah. And I mean, your body doesn't really know that bicycles didn't exist in, you know, the Pleistocene mm. or whatever. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's kind of silly. You were going to say something? Well, just that it's funny that they have to go back thousands of years to emulate an active lifestyle when even just 100 or 200 years ago, we had more active lifestyles. Right. It, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. And and again, you know, having an active lifestyle where you were doing a lot of walking or where you were just, again, not sitting mm -hmm. quite so much, it seems like it probably is better for us. Right. Well, one thing I, I was going to say is that um, in terms of activity level, it may be bad to just do exercise for one hour a day and then sit eight hours a day. But I have to say that it's it's terribly hard to edit a video while you're running down the street. <laughs> it's just not yeah, true. Indeed, you know, and, and some of this stuff, again, that ship has sailed. Yeah. Um, we're, we're just not realistically going to go back to a lifestyle where all of us are living like we would have been 10,000 years ago or even 300 years ago. Right, and I think most doctors tell you that that's the realistic approach. You know, I mean, you can do little things rather than just exercising vigorously one hour a day and not doing anything for the rest of it. You can do things like walking to your work instead of taking mm -hmm. the bus or driving or something like that. One thing I would do is do squats on the elevator when there's no one else in the elevator. I usually do it while people are on the elevator and they <laughs> okay, look at me. Go. They look at me really funny. Yeah. <laughs> so another big debate in the debate about natural living, topics of sex and relationships and how there's a natural way to run these relationships. You know, the natural model has been used as a challenge for the notion that monogamy is not natural and that men are supposed to spread their seed far and wide. I've heard this so much, especially from people who are in the poly community. Um, well, or at least it comes up pretty much every time a, an older male politician ends up having an affair with a young you know, <laughs> right. that, that someone sooner or later starts talking about how this is just inevitable because it was in his genes or you know something like that, yeah. Right, and I have to say that I was actually guilty of thinking that this is probably a correct you know supposition at one point, but I don't really see that that's really viable anymore. Um, is it, so, well, so, so if you look at humans and you look at us kind of compared to a lot of our primate relatives, human beings seem like we came from ancestors that were polygynous, meaning that males had a tendency to at least seek out multiple females. We're slightly polygynous, but we're nothing compared to, say, gorillas, for example, or, you know, some of our other primate relatives. So it's clear that, you know, we don't have a lot of tendency to be polygynous. One thing that a lot of the discussions about monogamy versus not monogamy forget about is that in human beings, we have something that a lot of our primate relatives don't have, namely children that require an enormous amount of care. 
our babies are incredibly helpless compared with the babies of many other species of animals and certainly even other species of primates. And what that means is that if you think about this whole spreading your seed, it sounds very reasonable initially because, sure, it's perpetuating your genes, fertilizing females. Isn't that what you know, evolution is all about? And, well, it is, but only to a point. If you're a male who fertilizes lots of females and then those females have babies that don't survive because the babies require an enormous amount of work and effort, often, you know, pretty much always from more than one person, then evolutionarily it's kind of a dead end, right? Right. So there's been a lot of selection in humans for taking care of kids and taking care of kids by parents, both parents. Right. Uh, Some really interesting evidence has come out recently suggesting that in human fathers, the hormone levels actually change after men are exposed to their own kids, and they develop hormonal changes that are associated with higher degrees of nurturing, Mm -hmm. which from an evolutionary perspective makes a whole lot of sense, and which, again, is not to say that having multiple sex partners isn't also part of our makeup. It probably is, but I think people just have this tendency to be so absolute about this and to think about, you know, oh, no, no, we were all just out having lots of sex partners all the time, in which case you think, well, who was raising the kids? Yeah. Like I said, in the poly community, there's a lot of people who are very adamant that this was the rule. And then there's people who are a little bit more reasonable when it comes to it. You know, there's a specific book I'm thinking of right now that I read a few years ago called The Ethical Slut. I forget who wrote it exactly. It's a little on the uh, spiritualist woo side, you know, but they do make a couple of good points where there's a nucleus to the relationship. And then outside of that nucleus, there's other people. So this may have been the way that relationships were formed, but there's no proof to that. So it re- I really don't know how that works. I'm not in the poly community, so I don't really know. I, I just think that that it, sounds like a little bit more of a reasonable It sounds like the thing. research says that as long as the children are being cared for yeah. by enough people, mm-hmm. <laughs> regardless of their gender, sexuality. Right. And yeah. there, there's no reason why the other people couldn't be caretakers either. Yeah. There's that whole, uh, what is it, the grandmother hypothesis? Well, yeah, and and there is obviously lots of evidence that in many human cultures there are lots of other individuals besides the mother that take care of babies. Mm -hmm. Right, and you mentioned that in your book. Part of this is, you know, evolution really produces a lot of different solutions to the same problem, and it's not like there's one way for families to be or one way for the sexes to interact or one way for people to eat or, you know, any of the rest of this. And I I think one of the interesting things about studying animals is you recognize how much variation there is out there and that there isn't just one way for the sexes to interact. And, you know, men are not always from Mars and women from Venus. And there's a lot less that's dictated even for animals by genes than people often think. Right. One of the other things I kind of want to talk about is babies and how helpless they are. That's partially... Yeah, so, so, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, we humans have a problem. Yeah. Because, so human beings are born at what's often considered to be a premature state. Mm-hmm. So our babies are much more helpless when they're first born than the babies of lots of monkeys and apes, which can do things like, for instance, hold on to their mothers as their mothers are moving around. And human babies can't do that. We think that that happened because human babies have these ginormous brains that continue to grow very rapidly after birth. I just actually reviewed a really fun book called How We Do It that's about the biology of human reproduction. That's that's very fun, in which the author Robert Martin points out that by all rights, human beings should have a pregnancy that was 21 months long, because that's what it would take to have us sort of be at the same developmental stage as our primate relatives. And, you know, so, of course, much to our, all of our reliefs, it's not. But it still means that when humans are born, they require an enormous amount of care that other primates don't. And that has led to a unique evolution in our family structure that you just don't see in other primates. Right, yeah, and there's what's called neoteny. And that pushes uh, the progeny of, of a group towards more of a fetalization of the adult yeah, you know. so, so human, human babies are really weird because on the one hand, they retain their juvenile characteristics, so even you know, toddlers still look a lot more like babies than they look like adults, whereas, again, in other species, a similar, at a similar stage of development, the juvenile would look a lot more like a miniature adult. Right. So we just have these ridiculously long childhoods. Well, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's also remarkable that within the human species, the sutures in our skulls, even, I mean, you can live to the age of 90 and they don't completely fuse, whereas I think in a chimp, 
they're fused at a really young age comparatively. That speaks to a lot of our development. Yeah, no, a lot. You know, there's there's a lot of things that have happened because of our brain size. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. What is it? A, a child's brain isn't fully developed until the age of three. I think it develops even further late into life, sometimes into their 30s. So it's it's kind of interesting. I wonder how much of the fact that we stand apart with our level of intelligence, as we call it, has an effect on this or the other way around. Like, I wonder what proportion of it. It's, it's you know. pretty much the neoteny makes it so that we can have these mm-hmm. bigger brains. Yeah. At least that's my understanding of it. I could be wrong. Yeah, well, but so, so again, it's, it's all kind of a feedback, like with the gene culture coevolution and the, the drinking milk, is that... Having a complicated society that where big brains are important then means that you're likely to have bigger brains, which then enables you to have a more complicated society, which then, you know, and so on and so forth. And I think that's one of the places to point out something that, again, I think is underappreciated by people sometimes, which is that culture is not something that happens independently of genetic evolution, that they really interact a lot. And the, the way I sometimes tell people is that having culture doesn't give you a get-out-of-evolution-free car. That it, right. it just makes another factor that you need to consider in evolution. And, you know, culture itself has been argued to evolve in its own way. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence for that. I mean, the concept of memes was proposed. I'm not talking about the meme that Richard Dawkins proposed, but the whole field of mimetics was kind of like a, a way to explain kind of a genetic uh, sort of structure to culture, which it really is kind of not explainable through mimetics, and people know that now. And at the very least, it seems like culture is just another pressure right. of our environment on us. Yeah, it really is. Would you say that this kind of thinking that the past was a better place and a degree of longing for simplicity is the main component behind this whole scheme of thought? Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I think it is something that seems to to come from a variety of places and some of which I guess you could even trace back to the Bible. But, yeah, I I think part of it is that the world is complicated and, you know, people want to make sense of it. I'm not trying to sound sort of facile, but, but that's part of it. Right. So I'm interested in, in gathering some information on what reactions you've gotten from people. Oh, yeah. I want to know that. Because uh, this, is, this is a really hot topic, and some people are really, really um, loud about it, you know, and stubborn <laughs> yeah. about it. So I just, I'm just interested in what you've heard. Um, so I was really surprised to discover that, I mean, I didn't really realize there was such a big paleo community. And so I was kind of surprised that people thought I was... I, I often have to tell people that, no, no, I did not write a diet book, and, hmm. uh, you know, I really don't care what you eat, and I, you know, it's just not something I was trying to do, that I've tried to write a book about evolution. I did write a book about evolution, um, or at least I think I did. So, yeah, I was a little surprised about that. For, there are some other people who feel like, you know, oh, well, but it's really nice to have something that actually talks about the science and that I can use in arguments with my uncle slash co-worker slash hairdresser about what they're doing or thinking. Or My intent was to give people a glimpse into how really cool and very complex our understanding of evolution is and how we really are starting to get an insight into how much we've changed just over the last few thousand years. So I was interested in it from the standpoint of, you know, what's happening with evolution, not so much, you know, what people should eat or how people should exercise. Right. I, I, I see that you drew a lot of um, a lot of information from the 10,000-year explosion, that book. I forget yeah, the authors of that book. Yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah, it was a really cool book. I like that one a lot. I still occasionally find myself paging through it. What can we expect next from you? So the first answer to that is I'm not actually working on a book right now. I, I do have a day job, so I'm a, a professor at the University of Minnesota, and I have lots of other things that I'm, I'm doing. Right. Um, so I don't have an idea for another book just yet because Paleo Fantasy did just come out. But I will tell you that a chapter that I didn't write that I wish I would have had time to, but I just didn't get a chance to put it in the book, is something on Paleo Fantasy pets. Because I wanted to talk about our domestic animals and the way we think about evolution as it affects them. One of the things that I find intriguing is that on the one hand, of course, we all accept that chihuahuas and, you know, poodles and little tiny, you know, terriers were evolved from wolves. And we don't have any problem with the fact that chihuahuas look incredibly different from wolves. And yet when we talk about training dogs, we often go back to this idea of, oh, well, you know, you have to think about the pack and you have to think about who's alpha and so forth. And so it's interesting to me that, you know, well, so is that really the case? Has behavior not changed at all, but the appearance of dogs has changed an enormous amount? And why have we been able to domesticate dogs, and would we be able to do that with other animals? And what constraints are there on how we, how we deal with the animals that we live with? So I keep thinking that that would be a really fun thing 
I still kind of am collecting sources on the evolution of dogs and, you know, what we now know. Because, again, we've sequenced the dog genome, and there's mm. a lot more information out there than, than there used to be. So Yeah, yeah. That, that could be an entirely new book. There's a lot of good information on that. There's also, there's this idea that there's, you know, a lot of people that believe that animal breeding is a natural thing you know uh, there's this whole naturalistic yeah, it fallacy back behind a lot it of the same issues no that's exactly right yeah that's a really incredibly interesting subject and i've gotten into a lot of arguments about that just a minor point when people use the naturalistic fallacy i tell them to go eat wild almonds yeah and see how well that turns out <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Marlene. That was a great interview, and you know, I hope to hear more from you in, in the future. Well, thanks a lot. You know, I'm I'm really glad you enjoyed the book. I always really appreciate it when people don't just want you know a tiny little sound bite of four words on, on something. So oh, I, I appreciate your interest. N- no way. That's not how we roll. Marlene's book is Paleo Fantasy: What Evolution Really Tells Us About Sex, Diet, and How We Live. It's available on Amazon and uh, also old school book format. Get your ebook form too. If you, you can want. get yeah. your ebook on. You can get your book <laughs> on. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for joining us today. Thanks a lot for having me. <laughs>